are now recording, I think. Um, so it's over to you, Suzanne. Great, thanks very much, Rob. Uh, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, from um, across um, across the world, really, today, which is very exciting. Um, so we today's presentation is um, uh, I'm going to be doing with uh, my colleagues, uh, Anne-Marie Farrell and Dr. Rowan Harbison from the Institute of Education at Dublin City University. We are going to uh, speak to you. We're building on a previous Moodle Munch presentation uh, that I did with my colleague Karen Buckley, also of the uh, Institute of Education, um, last year. And it was around the development of a UDL toolkit for Moodle. Uh, and we're just going to build on, on that conversation today. Um, just to very quickly link it to the DigiComp Edu framework, uh, this piece of work uh, links to um, area number five, empowering learners, just, just by way of reference for you. Okay, so today we're, I'm not going to rehash what we did um, in the presentation last year. We spoke in great detail around the development of the, the UDL toolkit, uh, the process of developing the toolkit and, and the kind of structure of it. Today, we're going to um, focus more so on reflections of the application of the toolkit. And I'm going to give you a very brief reminder of the concept and process behind the toolkit. And then Lorraine and Anne-Marie are going to kindly share their reflections on applying um, the toolkit in practice, both in Moodle and slightly outside of, uh, of Moodle as well. Anne-Marie is going to speak about her own UTL practice and that will take us a little bit beyond Moodle. Um, but if you want to find out more about uh, the, the UDL toolkit in detail, um, we have the recording of the Moodle Munch, which I'll pop into this presentation, and also a link to the, the toolkit. The toolkit is available on Creative uh, Commons licensing, and we'd uh, very much encourage you to, to share and adapt for your own context. I'm sure most of you here today are familiar with universal design for learning and that framework, but just for, for the benefit of those who, who are not familiar, I would direct you to the toolkit where we have a deeper um, explanation around the framework. But essentially it's a framework for inclusive practice and when we're talking about inclusive uh, learning design here and uh, we're talking about designing learning for everybody uh, for the benefit of everybody so not just for those with special um, needs in relation to teaching and learning uh, and that that uh, framework is support, supported by three key principles uh, multiple means of engagement or flexible ways of learning for students, multiple means of representation, flexible study resources and facilities, and then finally, multiple means of action and expression of learning or flexible assessments. So again, not, not too much detail on that today, but more information in the UDL toolkit should you need it. Uh, okay, so why did we develop a toolkit? Well, uh, Karen Buckley and I, uh, and together with other colleagues in the Teaching Enhancement Unit and our colleague uh, who has since moved to the, the DCU Business School, Shadi Karazzi, we wanted to find a kind of a practical way to translate those UDL principles into practice. So to scaffold uh, staff who are teaching, uh, involved in teaching, both academics and teaching support, to scaffold their practice uh, you know, translated essentially in, in, into practice, particularly in Moodle, but also, as you will see, uh, to stretch beyond Moodle as well. Okay. Uh, the toolkit development was very much a collaborative process. So we started here with the planning stage, uh, just highlighted in yellow there. We did a sketch outline of the toolkit, which essentially um, includes uh, an introduction to, to UDL. Uh, secondly, uh, a Moodle template, a Moodle page template to support uh, UDL practice. Uh, and then importantly, a checklist um, of UDL practice. Uh, and again, you can find out more detail in the link to the toolkit. Then we took that sketch outline of the toolkit to uh, two focus groups. We got some feedback on, on the, the, um, the structure of the toolkit. We took that feedback uh, and we revised the toolkit. And then our next stage was to actually work with staff. Uh, Lorraine and Anne-Marie uh, worked with us back in September, 2019, which seems a million years ago and only yesterday as well. 
um, to, to pilot the toolkit, to support them in a scaffolded session where myself and Karen offered them additional support and just discussion time really, because Lorraine, Anne-Marie and their colleague Ellen did all the work. They were redesigning their Loop uh, or Moodle pages. Loop is, is Moodle at DCU. Uh, and, and we offered them just kind of time to reflect um, uh, and kind of answer questions around that process. So I'm going to pass over now to Lorraine firstly, uh, and then to Amory to share their reflections. So over to you, Lorraine, and you can just direct me along the slides as well there. Okay, so as you can see, this was the starting point um, when both Karen and Suzanne, well, we sat down and we were looking at our existing learning environment. At the time, as you can see, this is what it looked like. So this is like a snapshot of the actual page. These were for uh, B Ed one first year um, undergraduates um, and the particular module I was looking at was maths education. Um, for me at that time, um, Moodle was was just what I loved. I, I, I loved it from the start, but for me it was just a lovely giant filing cabinet where I could store everything online um, and from that just make it accessible to the students where they were maybe my lecture notes, my slides, etc. But you will notice the whole time we've been talking so far, the emphasis was on me me as a teacher and really if we move on to the next slide this is where the journey started so it focused on me me as a teacher m for moodle m for me to actually this is meant to be a virtual learning environment and if we we're talking about the principles of universal design for learning have i actually thought about how i'm actually using moodle as a learning environment. So to begin with, as, as with, with most of our colleagues in DCU, we, we began to do a lot of work on just the actual design of the um, Moodle page to begin with. Um, there's also like a learning design units that would help if, if, if that were needed. And um, we were actually happy kind of to make a start on that. So from the outside, so when you think of multiple means of representation, you can see that, well, it does look easier to navigate. But multiple means of representation is really only one element. And what's moved to the fore more so is this idea of learner and learner engagement. And how actually can we um, enable students and the word that Suzanne was using from the digital strategy was empowering students to engage fully with this learning environment. So I just want to give you a snapshot of what two elements of this learning environment looked like as a method of, of engagement. So moving on to the next slide. Sorry, does somebody want to come in there? No, that's no go ahead, Lorraine. Uh, thanks. I'm Rob, I'm just here talking in the background. No worries. So well, the first element was um, our recommended reading section, whereas before we would have had, you know, kind of PDFs and links, et cetera, for the students to explore. But we went one step further, and this again was with the help of um, Suzanne and Karen, um, and I was looking at developing our own resources. So in, in this way, then, we could design our own resources that would meet the needs of our students. Um, and I just want to flag from the outset that this was not done alone. This was done very much in collaboration with my colleague Mary Kingston. Um, you know, so we really kind of, I suppose, built on each other's strengths here. So in designing this um, recommended reading, we decided we would make our own book and it was looking at teaching measures in the classroom. You can see we took text and images that would normally have been part of a, a PowerPoint presentation and started to rework them into a book where students could actually go chapter by chapter. And what we actually did with, and moving on to the next slide there, Suzanne, was the interactive elements. Um, if you want to request access, you'll have to get the access there from Mary Kingston, if that's okay. Um, no, don't, don't worry about that. We, 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 this, un, unless people would like to. But what it actually is here is we decided ourselves to um, incorporate videos. So we made videos. This was the beauty of, of being able to develop our own resources from a learner's perspective. So what we did was we went into um, on campus and we recorded there, there are unicams or you could call micro teaching type rooms where we would have recorded ourselves and we would have uploaded those videos as part of that book. So when the students were engaging, not only was it going to be text, but there's going to be text, 
there was graphics, and then there were um, actual video excerpts of us in action there using the resources. You know, if you want me to come back to us and share the screen, I can absolutely do that, but no worries for the moment. The next element, and we're talking about maximizing engagement, was to look at assessment. Okay, so up to now, assessment, you'd all be very aware, students can get very heads up on, on, you know, that summative, that grade, and that's really important. But what we wanted to help the students to do was, again, back to this idea of empowering them, was to help them on that learning journey. So we wanted to take them from being where they were after just doing their leave insert, they were students to actually now we were trying to um, encourage them to be moving to the other side to be teachers and we, we need them to take control of their own learning. So we wanted to develop kind of self paced um, tasks for them. So at the end of every seminar, they might have some little thing to read. And again, ask maybe answer little questions on that. Um, what we did was we we when we were exploring the the loop page. One activity we really thought we, we loved was this lesson format. Again, when, when, when you just read what it, it can empower you to do, there were so many things that just really appealed to us, like flexibility of design, learner engagement, etc. Just to let you know, that's kind of not how it worked. Um, we wanted these experiences to be very formative, but, but unfortunately that actual lesson activity meant that when the students would do an answer, at the very end, they could go back and review their answers that they had um, written. But once they kind of pressed that submit button, that was it, it was gone. Um, so what I've posted up here was, the, the, you know, panic from students. Lorraine, I, I thought I have it done, but I don't know if I have it done. When I go in, it looks like I have to do this again. And students redoing this and redoing and redoing the same exercises. We even were trying to work with, with, with a grade book, even though at the end it comes up, congratulations, you've finished your lesson. That's lovely. There was another thing underneath and we just could not get rid of it. It was, first of all, it was, you got say zero out of three questions, correct? If we had three questions. We were able to change that, you got zero out of zero questions. We even um, got on to Henry Langton there. Um, Henry came in, at which stage he tried to play with this and the best we could get was these assessments will not be added to your final grade. So as you can see, what we thought was going to be this wonderful new addition to our loop page ended up not really the way we wanted it to be. So that brings us to where we, we did come to. And this is the next slide there, Suzanne, and be glad to know my last one. We end up having to go back to the um, quiz format. So again, the students would go in every week and they, we, we, it, it was very similar. So from assessing us up point of view, very similar to assess up, but I suppose a bit, bit easier for the students at the end, at least they could see their responses because what we wanted them was that at the end of the module, before they would actually do their final assignment, that they would be able to go back onto the loop page, see what they had written. And that would be like, as in their study notes there. So, so that's where it went. Um, now I'm going to pass on to Anne-Marie if that's all right and then I think at the end then very happy to take any questions you have and I think hopefully my colleague Mary Kingston is here and she will be able to help us as well if needed. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, well as Suzanne said there at the beginning um, she linked in with myself and Lorraine and another colleague Ellen um, when they were developing that when herself and Karen were developing the toolkit and I suppose the heavy emphasis at the time was on using universal design for learning the principles of universal design um, in the Moodle space. So a bit like Lorraine, um, I had um, and really continued to look at Moodle primarily as a filing cabinet, as a resource that supported uh, teaching and learning. And um, what I found very useful about being involved with the toolkit, like me, Lorraine and I work in initial teacher education. So we're, we're, we're teachers who are working with student teachers. So both of us, uh, even prior to the development of the, the toolkit would have been talking about universal design for learning in relation to our students and um, our student teachers. But what was interesting was, was with me anyway, 
was it being evolved with the design, with, with the uh, rollout of the toolkit with Suzanne and Karen in relation to Moodle specifically, really got me thinking much more about the Moodle space, much more than I had previously. Um, and one of, I suppose one of the things that I did after that experience was to make sure that my voice was literally on the Moodle page. So, so you know, um, a, a recording a welcome message and so on that students could link in with asynchronously. And just to make, give myself a presence on that page above and beyond one that was text-based. Based. The other really useful thing that came out of, of the, the development of the toolkit was the Teaching Enhancement Unit in DCU um, applied the principles to the skeleton of everybody's loop Moodle pages. So, so th there was a basic redesign done there, and I actually found that really, really useful. Um, the, the, the basic framework was there, and it meant that, and still does mean, that when students go into the Moodle pages, they are generally faced with a very similar uh, layout, not exactly the same, we don't all have to stick to the exact same layout, but, but they're quite similar across all of the loop pages, which makes it really useful, um, particularly on, you know, uh, really large undergraduate programs with lots and lots of modules. Um, the, I suppose my, my the university, I've always looked at university design for learning as, uh, or, and Moodle uh, as being just one part of teaching and learning. Um, and university design, uh, seeped has seeped into other elements of my teaching as well. So looking at this from a teacher's perspective, the the the, the design of the loop or the Moodle page um, using universal design for learning is just one element of universal design for learning in my practice um, because it has mattered when I am physically teaching in class. Um, it has mattered when I'm developing assessments and so on. But what, what, what's been really interesting to me since uh, last March, since the 13th of March, is how the principles of universal design and the fact that with Suzanne and Karen's help, I had looked at that in the Moodle space really, really helped me when everything moved into the Moodle space last March. So the filing cabinet became the classroom and, and how the classroom was organized um, really mattered, not just in terms of, of, you know, signposting clearly resources and so on, but actually a, a space in which the teaching was happening and learning was happening in, in that space. And it really, really helped me conceptualize the framework of UDL, helped me think about the blend, for example, of synchronous and asynchronous engagement. And it, it made me divide asynchronous, for example, into two, to think about it in two different ways. So I would think, first of all, and I'm thinking of one particular module in particular, the first module that I moved online in September, the module I moved online just last September, which has 429 students in it, the final year uh, undergraduate module. And the, the, it was really challenging to move that module online, but the, the UDL framework helped frame my thinking around that. So in relation, for example, to asynchronous engagement, I thought about it in two different ways. I thought about it, firstly, asynchronous engagement, which would lead directly to a live class and live learning. And then the other type of asynchronous engagement, which would support independent study, which wouldn't necessarily have um, uh, lead directly into a live class, but might, might be required for, for independence, broader independent study for assignments and so on. And just how I, I structured that really was informed by the UDL um, framework, particularly around multiple means of engagement so, and multiple means of representation. So how core concepts were presented asynchronously and then followed up and supported synchronously. Really, the structure for that 
was enabled by, by my experience of using UDL in Moodle as a filing cabinet first before it became a classroom. And I think going forward, my, you know, I, I have a much broader um, understanding, I suppose, and um, I'm more flexible uh, than I was uh, 12 months ago before COVID. And I think a lot of the elements, uh, particularly around asynchronous engagement, I will continue forward, even if we are back face to face with 430 students, there will be elements of, of the Moodle page that I will absolutely continue forward into that more face to face um, context. So look, that's just a brief overview or reflections. I don't know if it makes sense, but um, uh, and thanks, Rob, for that. Thank you guys very much. Um, I'm just going to pause the recording now. Perfect. Over to you, Adele. Hi, Rob. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you all today. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to see so many friendly and familiar faces. Feels like a, a family. Um, so my name is Edel Gavin and I'm the Technology Enhanced Learning Coordinator or Tab Coordinator at Mayo Slide Rally Term ETB. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Laureen Devani, our e-learning mentor for the Sales Apprenticeship Programme, and she's also our Moodle guru. We also have Siobhan Magner here too, the, the National Sales Programme Manager. So today we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, our learner background, the background of our learners and our core platforms. Um, we're, we're going to look at the learner journey. We'll have a little bit about our educator's journey, and we're going to show some practical examples of collaboration um, using the sales apprenticeship program. So just to be specific, our core platforms are um, Office 365, Moodle, and Microsoft Teams. And we use those together to support our learners to learn together. So just to frame this, um, we can map this to the teaching and learning on the Digicom, Digicom Edu competencies framework and more specifically to collaborative learning section 3.3 so this is to use digital technologies to foster and enhance learner collaboration so just a little bit of background um, further education and training or FET learners are very very diverse very diverse in terms of their age their socioeconomic background their cultural background the levels of literacy and numeracy and the digital skills that they have attained and we have a saying that FET is for everybody and it has opportunities for everybody so Moodle is the LMS provided by and supported by Solus but we also use Office 365 and Microsoft Teams our educators use our core platforms in a variety of different ways. Some of our educators use Office 365 and Teams as a light VLE for emergency and remote learning, and other educators use Moodle, Microsoft Teams and Office 365 combined. So really, they're the ones we're going to focus on today. So I'm just going to talk you through the learning journey, and then I'm going to give you a demo of how that might look like. So all our learners have Office 365 accounts, and they use an open ID connect single sign in feature when they come into Moodle. So you can just see how that looks on the right. So the journey is very seamless for our learners. Once they're in Moodle, there's a Microsoft, Microsoft block and that's also there on the right. And they have access to their various um, office tools there. They can use um, email, they can get into Teams or, or, or whatever they need. So we also encourage our learners to sync their calendars the Moodle, so that all of their online classes appear in their calendar. Learner collaboration options are quite varied with Teams and Moodle. So just to mention it, a few, you have video conferencing software with Teams. There's also breakout rooms in Microsoft Teams. Teams can be used for learner group projects and also there's the Moodle forms. So just bear with me and I'm just gonna show you a quick demo. In this video, I demo how our learners use Moodle with Teams. All learners can sign into Moodle using their Office 365 username and password using the Open ID Connect button. Rob, can I just confirm that everybody can hear that? Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, all good. So in this case, our learner is Telesupport.
that cold. Okay, so I'm brought directly to my graphic design um, Moodle site. And here, as a learner, I can access my online weekly class and the any of the channels for the group projects that have been set up by the tutor. So to access the uh, weekly class, I simply click on the link. Teams opens. OK, so I can see the corresponding team in, in Teams for graphic design class. And when it comes to Monday at two for my class, I can click here. And join. OK, if I go back to Moodle, just to finally point out to you, um, we've got a Microsoft block here in Moodle and it means all Office 365 apps are just one click away. Learners can go directly to their email OneDrive Teams by clicking these links and the app will open in a new tab in their browser. So I'm just going to talk you through the educator's journey and then we're going to have another quick demo. So for the educator, a course or a module is set up in Moodle and from here a team is automatically set up. So on this team, the teacher is the owner and the student is the member. And this all happens because of Microsoft Azure integration with Moodle. So also, if you add an additional, additional person to your Moodle course, um, this is automatically synchronized and they're also added to the team. And also teachers can set up meetings in the calendar and embed them into Moodle and teachers can set up reoccurring meetings for group projects. So I'm just going to show you how that might look. In this video, I demo one way you can use Moodle with Teams to schedule weekly classes and group project work. As with all technology, there are alternative ways you can do this. So I'm logged in as an administrator in Moodle and I've set up a new Moodle course for my module called Graphic Design Demo. Um, you can see here I've enrolled myself as a teacher and Tell Support as a student. Both of these profiles are linked to Office 365 accounts. And as Office 365 is integrated with Teams, once a new course is created on Moodle with one teacher role assigned, a Microsoft team is automatically created. So when I go to Teams, I can see here there's a corresponding team called Graphic Design Demo automatically created. When I click into it, have a look at the team, I can see membership is synchronized. I've got the owner, Lorraine, and member tell support. So let's say I have my graphic design um, online class on a Monday from two to four, and I want to set up a virtual classroom for it. So first thing I'm gonna do is create a channel. I'm just gonna go graphic design. Classroom. Click here so everybody can see it and add it. So in my virtual classroom channel, I'm going to come up here and schedule a meeting. And again, I'm going to call the meeting graphic design. Um, it's going to repeat weekly on a Monday. Okay, from two to four. Okay, so graphic design current weekly on a Monday from two to four, and it's added to my graphic design virtual classroom channel. So I create this here, and when I go back to the channel, I can see here the schedule meeting graphic design occurs every Monday at two. So what I want to do now is get a link to this channel and add it to my Moodle course. So I'm going to add it as a label. Okay. 
weekly class and add the hyperlink to the channel. Okay, so now students can access their online class any of three ways. Okay, when you set the um, the online class up through Microsoft Teams, okay, students will get an email into their inbox inviting them to join the class. They can join it from there. The event will also appear in their calendar. So I'm logged in as my student now, Tell Support. So I can see uh, my graphic design class there is scheduled from two on the Monday. Okay. Or alternatively, I can go to Moodle, click on the weekly class link. And that brings me to my Teams channel. Okay. And I can join my class from here either. Okay. So, um, close out of this. Similarly, you can set up recurring meetings and channels to facilitate group work. For example, at this module, students are divided into four groups to complete projects. So I would first of all create a channel um, for each um, group. So I might call it meeting room A, another channel meeting room B, C and D. Add a recurring meeting to each channel, just like I did this one here, okay? And then create a link to Moodle uh, from the channel, just like I did with this channel here. And once you set up the meeting rooms, you can reuse them for all project work by changing the students you assign to each meeting room for each project. The diagram here shows the various tell tools um, that support collaboration on the sales apprenticeship program. So the integration of Moodle and Office 365 is really the backbone of this program and it ensures that the, the collaboration is seamless between the workplace and the education provider. It also allows everybody to benefit from the best features of each product. So I'd just like to say thank you all for your attention um, this afternoon and a special thank you to my colleagues whose work I'm showcasing here today. So I'll open the floor to questions. Thank you very much, Adele.